Good morning. Whether you are a First Presbyterian member or a friend or a first time visitor, we're glad that you're here. And we hope that you will experience God's welcome as we join together in worship. Please take a moment to find the friendship registers and to sign those. And as people continue to arrive uh, and join you on your pew, please be sure to pass the pads to them. And speaking of first-time visitors, do we have anyone who's here who's worshiping with us for the first time? If you'll raise your hand high enough for me to see it, I have a pound cake for you. But I don't see any hands. So I'll just remind you to take note of the church calendar, which you'll find on the back of the bulletin. And I want to highlight that this Thursday is the first of four Sunset Suppers uh, hosted by the McClouds. If the youngest person in your household who's currently living under your roof was born in January, February, or, or March, then this Thursday evening is your week to come to the McClouds between 6 and 8 p.m. for a cookout. So that's the youngest person currently living under your roof, born in January, February, or March. There's not going to be a program, no, no sermons, um, just a bite to eat and an opportunity to have fellowship with your church family. You can respond either to the church office uh, or by emailing Jenny McLeod, uh, and that would be helpful. And now as we listen to the prelude, let's prepare to enter God's courts with praise. Mm -hmm.
Let us call each other to worship. We are here to worship God, whose love for us is more than we can ask or imagine. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Amen. proclaims, God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion on all who fear him. Knowing that our only hope of healing and restoration is found in the merciful, fibrillating heart of the universe, let us confess our sins as we pray the prayer of confession together. O God, whom we profess to love with our whole body, mind, heart, and soul, we plead guilty. We have made loud speeches extolling the attributes of love. We have exhausted our own resources trying to live up to love to man. We know that love's claim on our lives has no rival, and yet where love's behavior is concerned, we continually come up short. Forgive us. Look deeply into our fear and our forgetfulness, and bring us closer to Christ, whose death on the cross will stand forever as the litmus test of love. Let us fall silent together before God.
mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. We do it in the assurance that God isn't merciful on a whim. Mercy is God's middle name. And God's messy, silent, heartbreakingly saving love bottoms our life with every step, with every breath we take. Jesus came to show us this, and it is in his name that I pronounce the good news. We are forgiven. Friends, in response to this good news of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with our soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors and ourselves. This is the way of Jesus, in whom we find life. I'd like to invite any children who are here to come uh, up front for our time together.
Good morning. Were you all paying attention just a minute ago? We had somebody playing the piano for us just a second ago. Could you hear that? Could you see who it was from where you were sitting? I couldn't see it because this big pulpit was in my way. So uh, the, the, the person who was playing his name, Anna Grace, Anna Grace Thompson. I'm going to get her to stand up. She didn't know I'm going to do this. So, I didn't have you do that so you'd get an ovation, but that's nice. Uh, the reason I uh, wanted Anna Grace to stand up is, I think I'm right about this, the first time I met Anna Grace, she was about the age that some of you are. I'm thinking she was about five. You're five. See, I knew she would be about the same age that some of you are. Some of you may be a little older than that, maybe a little younger, but most of you are, are sort of around the age of five, and that's how old Anna Grace was when I first met her. And what I learned about her the first time I met her was not only did she like music, she was starting to figure out that she wanted to learn how to make music by not only using the instrument that God gave her, her voice, but also learning how to play other musical instruments. And I know some of y'all are doing that same thing. And it's been fun uh, over these last number of years to watch her learn to play these musical instruments and then she might play them in a lot of different places, but one of the places she plays her musical instruments is here in church. And one of the reasons people do that is God gives us talents and abilities, and we work on those and try to make them, try to get as good as we can, and, and then we offer those back to God. As a, we, we play our music for God as a way of saying, Thank you, God, for giving me this, this, this love for music, this desire to make music. And so it's been fun to watch Anna Grace and a lot of other people around here develop their talents and their abilities because that's one of the ways that we honor God, uh, by taking the gifts that God gives us and then, in a way, kind of giving them back to God as we make music or whatever our talent is. And I tell you that because it's, it'll be fun, this will be hard for you to think about, but it'll be fun for us as your church family to watch you develop your own talents and gifts and abilities as you learn what it is that brings you joy. And those are the gifts that God gives you. And it'll be fun for us to see what those gifts are and to see how you might use them to say thank you to God. And, and it's not just with music. Uh, this is really what all of us are supposed to be about. Big kids and little kids and old people like me alike is we're supposed to be finding out what it is we love and then doing the best we can using those gifts that God gives us and then offering them back to God. Some of y'all are already starting to do that, so it's going to be fun for us to watch you do that over the next uh, number of years as it's been fun to watch uh, a, lot of, a lot of the young people in this church uh, who've done that recently. So I just wanted you to know a little bit about that story. And also this is my way of saying I'm going to be sort of watching y'all and we're all going to be watching you and, and watching you find joy in the talents and gifts that God has given you. So I've got a very brief prayer for us to say. So let's, let me pray and then you uh, say after me. So let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, we thank you for the talents you give us. We look forward to offering them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming to see me today. Let us pray. O oh God, through these words that are ancient and ever new, may we come to know the truth about ourselves. And through your bottomless mercy, may we find life. Amen. 
The first scripture lesson comes from the book of the prophet Jonah. Jonah has just delivered a harsh message to the people of Nineveh, and in response, they have given up their evil ways. This was not the outcome Jonah was hoping for. So we pick up in chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? And then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what might become of the city. Then the Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. And Jonah was happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked God that he might die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you were concerned about the bush? for which you did not labor and which you did not grow? It came into being in the night, and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And from the Gospel of Matthew, the 12th chapter. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But Jesus answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented the proclamation of Jonah and see Something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and see something greater than Solomon is here. The word of the Lord. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Several years ago, the New York Times ran an obituary which reported the death of the joke. In an article titled, Seriously, the Joke is Dead, the Times elaborated. The joke died recently after a long illness of, oh, 30 years. Its passing was barely noticed, drowned out by the din of ironic one-liners, snark, and detached bon mots that pass for humor these days. The joke died a lonely death. There was no next of kin, Bob Newhart's imaginary telephone monologues having passed on long before. The article was brilliant, but to paraphrase America's greatest humorist, reports of such a demise are greatly exaggerated. For in fact, the joke is as timeless as the book of Jonah. People are often shocked when they ask about my favorite books of the Bible. And while the list always changes, Jonah always ends up in the top three. The fact that Jesus drops this reference about Jonah into his tete-a-tete with the Pharisees is mouth-watering. But besides being intrigued by that, I've always appreciated a good joke. Jonah was a minor prophet who lived in Joppa. The joke is set up in the very beginning when God gives Jonah an outlandish assignment. He's told to go to Nineveh and announce God's verdict on their wrongdoing and the utter undoing that's going to befall them. Given that the city is 60 miles across, clearly the job is too big for one reluctant prophet. But the larger issue is that as far as Jonah is concerned, Nineveh is anathema. It's the epicenter of the evil empire that's been plundering Palestine for two centuries, burning its cities and deporting its inhabitants. This is like asking Ronald Reagan to go preach to the Russians And I really apologize for bringing the Russians into this. Nevertheless, right on cue, Jonah says, you've got to be joking. But God had never been more serious. So Jonah booked passage on a boat for Tarshish, which was about as far from Nineveh as he could arrange to travel. When a great storm came up, After the voyage got underway, the sailors cast lots to see which passenger had gotten on the wrong side of the gods. And when the finger of fate pointed to Jonah, he insisted that they throw him overboard immediately, which prompted these presumably pagan sailors to get down on their knees and worship Jonah's god because they were convinced that Jonah's action was a sign of his great courage and compassion. But Jonah didn't give a flip about them. He only knew that he would rather drown than go to Nineveh. Cue the big fish. Of course, this is the most familiar part of the story. A creature of the deep appointed by God, swallows Jonah and entombed in the belly of the fish, Jonah prays. Is it a sincere prayer? 
not in the sense of being bone deep or truly penitent, but here's the good news. God is available even when we pray like petulant toddlers. Then in an authentic baptismal experience, Jonah is brought up out of the water and delivered from the jaws of death. And Jonah 3.1 says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And if you listen closely, you can hear the laughter of the ancient Hebrew audience as God repeats word for word what God told Jonah the first time. Professional comedians call this effect a callback. Finally, Jonah turns toward Nineveh. And you've got to hand it to Jonah. He never breaks character. He drags his feet all the way. And when he arrives in Nineveh, he says exactly eight words. Five words if you're reading along in Hebrew. Forty more days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And just like that, the entire city, including livestock, comes forward singing, just as I am, without one plea. And when Nineveh repents, God relents. God commutes Nineveh's sentence. He cancels the impending punishment. And they all lived happily ever after. Not on your life. In true dramatic fashion, there's a complication left to be resolved in the third act. Jonah 4.1 says, but this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became extremely angry. It's right here that the story drops all pretense of being an entertaining little fish tale and begins to focus sharply on the heart condition it's meant to diagnose. Rather than ratifying God's decision to give Nineveh another chance, rather than turning cartwheels and celebrating the peace and kindness and generosity that is flowing out of this transformed city, Jonah is scandalized by God's conduct. Taking Psalm 103, an ancient Hebrew psalm of praise, and turning it into a complaint, Jonah rails out, I knew all along that you are a gracious and merciful God, that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I knew that you would grasp at any straw to keep from punishing those people. And then for the melodramatic crescendo, Jonah stomps off to sulk, muttering a line that will be milked by comedians for millennia. Just kill me now. Comics speak of the rule of threes, meaning a joke get, gets its greatest laugh when the situation comes around for the third time. When God speaks to Jonah for the third time, I wouldn't say that the laughs are greater, but they're definitely deeper. As we begin to see ourselves in this funhouse mirror, begin to see that Jonah embodies our own smallnesses, our own distorted way of seeing things. Are you angry, Jonah? Really, God asks. 
do you think that my showing mercy reveals a flaw in my character, an imperfection in my nature? What if you're right, Jonah? What if your way is better than my way? What if I were to stop all of the affirmative action right this minute? What would happen to you, Jonah? And then to sharpen the point even finer, God engages in a little improv. I just love this part. God causes a bush to grow up. And Jonah is elated because the bush provides shade from the scorching sun. But suddenly, a pesty little worm comes along and attacks the bush just as a hot wind blows in from the desert. And you can just see God standing off to the side, prompting Jonah. Look at the bush, Jonah. The bush is like my mercy, that you have done nothing to earn, yet it shades you all the time. It's your lifeline. And the worm? Well, that's what would happen if I were to play strictly by the rules. If I were to run with your plan, and give every living soul his just desserts. Oh, I know you would love nothing better than to see me blow Nineveh sky high. But without my mercy, what would become of you? When I come to this point in the story, I can't help but think of the older brother in the story of the prodigal son, when the father, with total abandon, welcomes and weeps over the dissipated and desperate younger son, his morally excellent older brother, clipboard and Protestant work ethic in hand, cannot muster so much as a flash of mercy. And even though he has everything he's ever wanted, even though his father begs him to come inside and join the homecoming party, he refuses to enter the banquet room and chooses instead to stay outside, separated from life and self. The only thing that could possibly make his heart dance would be the public shaming of his loser little brother and his father's endorsement of his own values by turning his back on him. This reminds me of the New Yorker cartoon where one dog says to the other, it's not enough that we succeed. Cats must also fail. (laughs) The German word for this is Schadenfreude, which loosely translated means you can only get your tank filled if someone else is left high and dry. As for the sign of Jonah, If you look in a commentary or Google it, they'll tell you that this refers to Jonah's death and resurrection experience, which will be replicated by Jesus. And this trailer about coming attractions is Jesus' answer to the scribes and Pharisees when they demand a sign. I'm not going to argue with Jesus. But here's another signpost that I want you to associate with Jonah and with Jesus. And it's a question mark. When we come to the end of the story, Jonah is still sitting outside of Nineveh, 
clenched, victimized, shut down, with his eyes riveted on the city, hoping against hope that God just might prove to be as small as he is. But even though he shows no signs of celebrating the wideness in God's mercy, except where his own self-interest is concerned, God doesn't quit. God doesn't say, go ahead and die, you self-righteous little bigot. No. God continues to impinge upon Jonah all the way to the final punctuation mark, which notably isn't a period. It's a question mark. And the question that's left to hang in the air is, Jonah, really? The cats must fail? But underneath God's rhetorical question is the larger question. And it's the same question that left the scribes and Pharisees hanging on their own nooses. How deep are you willing to dive to find the treasure that will give you life, the treasure that will save the world? Are you willing to dive deep enough to let go of your need to be right? Deep enough to let go of your need to get even? Deep enough to discover that mercy is the only way you will ever be breathed to life. Even though it was written over 26 centuries ago, because the book of Jonah is the only book in the Bible that ends with a question. I'm willing to bet my whole wad that that question mark isn't aimed at Jonah. It's aimed at us. If this is the word of God that's meant to change us, how will our lives be different from now on? To God be the glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen.
As we continue to stand in the presence of God, let us say what it is we most deeply believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare to pray together, I want to share with you some of the prayer concerns before uh, our church family. Uh, a longtime member of the church, a longtime member of the Cornelia class, as long as she was able, uh, Margaret Ayers White died earlier this week. Her daughter is Barbara Shand, which might be a connection with you as you remember her, but we want to remember that family. Kimberly Johnson has uh, returned to the hospital this week uh, following some chemo uh, just to try to tend to some reaction there. want to remember Kimberly. Babs Nichols is having some surgery this week. Uh, uh, we'll be in and out of the hospital very quick, but we're going to pray for a good uh, uh, surgery and quick recovery. And Dan Schull is at home recuperating from his second knee replacement. Uh, he anticipates recovery being easier the second time because he's Got a good knee. He got one good knee and one knee to, uh, brand new replaced, and so he's looking uh, to bounce back pretty quickly. So those are some of the concerns. We also have some joys. Our midweek uh, uh, blood drive was a success, uh, thanks to a lot of folks who drove back into town to give blood. Also, our sign on the front, uh, on the sidewalk, drew some people in from uh, the streets to give blood, which we're grateful for, and so we thank you for all who supported that. Another one of our joys today is that this congregation has been uh, fostering in its young people an impulse toward mission. And uh, uh, today we are going to, as a part of this time of joys and concerns and prayers, are going to commission a group of folks who are heading um, to Asheville to participate in Asheville Youth Mission. Uh, and these are middle school uh, folks. And I'm going to get you all to go ahead and stand up and actually uh, come up. Since you're all dressed up, they're going to get a good look at you. Actually, they came pretty uh, relaxed to church today. It's because they're getting ready to get on a bus and uh, travel to Asheville. Um, and in these days of 100 degrees, Asheville sounds pretty good right now. You may know that uh, Asheville Youth Mission, um, guess where it originated? Asheville. It's, uh, but, but we are now, we are the secondary site. A few years ago, we had this grand experiment to see if we could be a host site for youth mission trips. And we've been doing that for the last few years. This, uh, as, as recently as last week, we had a group, I think, of, of Episcopalians from Philadelphia here. Uh, and so the word is out that uh, Raleigh is a site for folks to come and do mission. And now, because of the success of Raleigh Youth Mission, Asheville Youth Mission has now expanded to Memphis, Tennessee. And so this is a growing thing. People realize that there is a passion that young people do want to engage in communities and make a difference in the world. Uh, and so there'll be yet another opportunity. But our young people, it's been their tradition to go to Asheville to kind of the mother site uh, to do mission there, and we're grateful for these young people who uh, are leaving today to do that. And most of the time, I think when we go off and do mission, we assume that we're going to change the people with whom we work. But the truth is about mission trips, and some of y'all have been on mission trips before, is we, are, we ourselves are impacted. And so what we fully expect to see you return to us uh, with a deepening discipleship, a deepening awareness of the needs of the world, and also maybe a new appreciation for how God can be at work in us as long as we seek to be useful to God. And so we hope that's what you'll discover. 
We also trust that you're going to make a difference in the lives of the people you meet because what you will show them is the love of Christ in a human face and uh, that's always compelling to people. And so as you prepare, I have a question for you and also for the congregation. Is it your intention to represent First Presbyterian Church and our Lord Jesus Christ in and among the people of Asheville, seeking to bear witness to the love and compassion of God as a sign of hope for the people there? If so, please say, yes, by God's grace. Yes, by God's grace. And for the congregation, do you commit yourselves to praying for this group, to pray God's blessing upon them, and that God's blessing will pour forth through them? If so, please say, we do. We do. And now let us pray. Lord God of grace, send us all as missionaries into your world. This is a hungry and hurting world. People feel isolated and alone. Not even knowing what they hunger for, they hunger for you. So we thank you for these young people and their leaders as they go to a new community to bear witness to the love they have received in Jesus Christ and who seek now to make that love available. Let their departure today be a reminder that you have called us all into the world. And we pray, O oh God, that you'll be at work among us and that you'll also, in the middle of this broken, hurting world, be a source of healing and hope and good news and gospel, that this world might continue to draw ever closer to the vision you had for it at creation. Lord God, you pushed back chaos that there might be a paradise. In our own rebellion against you, the chaos has returned. But in Jesus Christ, we have seen glimpses of what you have in mind for us. We pray your blessing upon this church that we might be a worthy witness to what you have done and are doing in the world in Jesus Christ. Give all of us an impulse to serve you as we serve our neighbors not for our glory, but for yours, and for our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Give us our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go in. The invitation to discipleship is by definition an invitation to generosity. For Jesus Christ, in pouring himself out for the world, shows what it is to live a fully human life. In this offering we make today, and in the offering of our lives and our life together, we are invited to pour ourselves out for the world. Not for our glory, but for the glory of God. And so let us continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offerings.
us pray. Lord God of grace, receive these gifts we bring and receive us. Make us worthy by Your grace to serve You, to offer ourselves to You. Make something of our ministry, O God, that Your name might be glorified in all the earth. We bring these and all of our prayers to You in the name of Your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. that God breathes into us and into the world in the face of everything that wants to hold us hostage, including our own smaller selves. So take time to breathe in all of the mercy you have seen and known, and then go out and invite others to come with you to the homecoming feast. And as you go, may the word of God wedge in your flesh. May the mercy of God marrow in your bones. And may the peace of God take root and grow in your hearts today and through all of your tomorrows. Amen. Amen.